Well, let's assume that you have, uh, you know, here's your list of debts. So you've got, you know, maybe three or four, you know, and this one, this one costs you $50 a month, and this one costs you $25 a month, this one costs you $125 a month. Here's your car payment, and, you know, I, you know, th this one's $100, whatever it is. Okay, and then, you know, whatever your outstanding balances are. The, the best way to do this, in my mind, you know, having helped people work their way through this, is to, um, you know, invert this in, w in whatever way makes the most sense. So like, for instance, let's say, let's say you owe 3,000 on this one, and you owe 5,000, well, let's see, 2,500 on this one, you owe 5,000 on this one, you owe maybe 8,000 on your car, and you owe $1,200 on this one, okay? So, if you look at that, which one should you pay off first? Okay, how many vote for paying off the big one first? How many vote for paying off the little one first? Okay, so let's assume that we pay off the little one first. Now what happens? So, so this, this one's now gone. Okay, now what do you do? Daniel, what? Yeah, so, so this one ought to then go on to this one here, right? So you can get rid of the 2,500 faster, all right? And now, now that you've gotten rid of the 1,200 and the 2,500, now you've got $125 and you put that one on this one and then you go after that one. So, you so what you do is you just, you know, keep the same amount of debt payment, but just move it up the ladder, but get rid of, you know, the easiest ones first. And then when you're finally done with this, uh, what does this all add to? Five, six, seven hundred dollars, okay? Now seven hundred dollars goes and pay, pays off this one right here, the eight thousand dollar one. Well, you know, that's gonna get, get rid of it in 11 months, 12 months. See, so, you know, if somebody were to work that, depending on what their financial situation was, you know, they could probably get themselves out of debt within, you know, two years. If it, but what, what do we usually do? How does this usually work? You know, we pay off the 1200 we got the $100, what do we do? We integrate it into our spending, right, and it becomes our out money, you know, the money we use to go to a movie, you know, our entertainment, you know, wh wherever it is, and it doesn't get reinvested into the debt machine, you know, to get rid of the debt. So, that, you know, that's, that's a simple principle but it sure has worked for a lot of people through the years. Okay, uh, got a couple minutes here. Let, let me give you what I think is the way to think about uh, financial planning. Okay, here's, here is all the money you earn. All right, you know, that's your salary, your bonuses, your commissions, you know, wh wherever all your income comes in. And of course, you know, some part is taken off for taxes, some part is taken off for fixed expenses like rent and so on. You know, then you've got your variable expenses. Variable. Okay, and so, you know, you only end up with, you know, this little increment up here to start funding your, your money machine, all right? So if we think of this as a, you know, a spout that's gonna pour off money from your income, all right? Then this comes down, let's say, into a wheelbarrow, all right? And, and so then this gets filled up, right? And now you've gotta do something with that. So, you know, what, what are your priorities in terms of, of how you're going to spin the wheelbarrow? Now, 
intuitively, you know, if, if this becomes bigger, right, what happens? More taxes, right? Because you know, more you earn, more taxes you pay. Larger fixed expenses, got to move to a bigger house, got to buy a new car, you know, got and more variable expenses, you know, uh, we're going to take another, we're going to take this trip we've really wanted all over, you know. And so what ends up happening is this sliver up here may stay the same or, you know, maybe it gets a little bit bigger, but it doesn't do too much. So, so when you're thinking about budgeting, you know, and you look at the total picture, you know, you've got to keep in mind the balance between y your lifestyle and what your long-term objectives are. So, you know, it's critical, especially if you're married, you know, that you have a plan and you've, you've thought this through with your spouse so that, you know, this isn't, you know, rough water for you. And again, you know, it, it's one of the two basic reasons why people have so many, so much, well, there's three basic reasons why people have so much trouble in their marriages. You know. So, we have this here. Now, there's four things that you've got to take care of probably before you can really start <coughs> accumulating. <coughs> One is a sinking fund for emergencies. <coughs> well, maybe I am going to use this water after all. Must be the residual from that cold. <laughs> um, okay, so you've got the sinking fund. Then you've got to be concerned about uh, <coughs> you know, loss of income due to you know job loss or whatever. <coughs> then you've got death and disability. <coughs> so, you know, it's it's good to allocate some of the dollars that come off of your your income into those areas. But hopefully you have, um, you know, you're able to, to, to manage this. And of course that gets into a whole discussion, you know, term insurance versus permanent insurance, what type of disability coverage. And I mean, there's all sorts of, <coughs> of options that involve that. But assuming that you've made it that far and your wheelbarrow still has some money into it, now what are you going to do? And what you're going to do is you're going to start allocating that into an investment program. And so think of, you know, um, I'm sure all of you at one time or another have gone to the beach and have maybe had two cups where you poured sand from one bucket to another. You know, I, I, I used to do that, it fascinated me. I, just, I could do it for hours. But um, if you think of this as a bucket with sand in it, and we're gonna pour that sand into a bucket, we're, let's, let's fill up this bucket right here with dollars from our wheelbarrow. Uh -huh. So now what's going to happen when that bucket gets full? Like sand into a cup. What's going to happen? Hmm? Well, it's going to overflow, right? Yeah. So it's going to come to the place where it's going to come down. So let's have another bucket under here that can capture those dollars as, as it overflows. So we fill this one up. And now we let the money flow down into this one. What happens when this one gets filled up? It'll overflow, right? Down into another bucket underneath here. All right. So you might think of that as a form of asset allocation. All right. Risk, you know, risk allocation. So here the risk would be very moderate. You know, here the risk would be uh, you know, more intermediate, <coughs> and here the, you might take a lot of risk, okay? So if we were to describe these three buckets with, r with um, you know, common economic thought, you know, one might be risk, how much risk are we taking, what type of rate of return are we going to get, and how much liquidity do we have? Those are three very important factors to take into consideration when you're thinking about an investment program, right? So the risk refers to what? See, a lot of people think it's the probability of loss, okay? And in some cases it is. 
But if you're a wise investor, you know, and you've made a good investment decision, the chances of losing everything's pretty slim, you know, unless you really go out on a huge limb and do something really dumb, okay? You know, I mean, there's never been a mutual fund that's ever gone broke. You know, they've disappeared and merged into other mutual funds, but no mutual fund has ever gone broke. Uh, no major insurance company has ever lost assets for its clients. You know, there have been some that have gone broke, but they always merge into another company. So, I mean, if you're, if you're pretty much down the middle of the road with the types of things you do, the chances of losing anything are, are fairly nominal. What you lose is the flexibility to liquidate it, okay? Because, you know, you could, like, you know, one of my years ago, I bought an office that was called a see-through. You know what a see-through is? That's when you drove by it on the freeway, you could see through it. <laughs> it was totally vacant, and it sat vacant for two years, okay? You know, that was a risk. We, we almost lost that building, and I had to liquidate everything I had in these to keep that building, because that building was down here in this bucket, and fortunately I had these two buckets working for me. So then when we saved the building, and then I had to build up the money in these two buckets again. But the point being that, you know, Risk is really more a function of volatility and what the value is at any given point in time than the fact that you're going to lose everything. And I could show you a lot on that, but we don't have time today. But so <coughs> in this bucket, the risk is, is on a scale of 1 to 10, maybe in the 1 to 3 range, okay, uh, or 2 even. You know, the rate of return is going to be inflation plus 2%, and the liquidity would be very high. You'll find in most investments are of, have a, a value, a, a return value based on inflation and then some intrinsic value for that investment. So money is only worth historically about 2%. Okay, but money becomes worth more if there's inflation or less, depending on how you look at it. But the, you know, what it can earn is usually the 2% plus inflation. So if we come into this category, the risk might be in the two to four range, okay? This might be inflation plus five to seven percent, all right? And the liquidity would be high here. And then you get into this third bucket where the risk is in the, you know, seven to 10 range, okay? The rate of return, you know, could be plus or minus infinity. In other words, you, you know, it would be possible perhaps, like that office building, to have lost that. And your liquidity is very low. In other words, it's almost impossible to get out of it. Now, what we have found through the years is that if the expected return in this is in the 10 to 15 percent range, all right, and a person has a choice of investing in those three investments, whether it's a tier one, tier two, or a tier three investment, and they see they can get a 10 to 15 percent return here, or a, you know five, five percent or six percent return here, or a two percent return here. Where do you think they want to invest? Remember the curve, you know, 10 percent you got, you know, 18, uh, you know, intervals. At two percent you got two in two intervals, right? So where are they going to invest? I, I saw you pointing. You were right. Where where, where are they going to invest? Typically. Two, three. Huh? Two, three. Two and three, yeah, right. But mostly in three. Okay? So people will will you know, sort of like lemmings off a cliff. <laughs> you know, they'll they'll gravitate down here to three. They won't have anything in one and two, all right, to to speak of. And then three, you know, becomes where they put their money. They have no liquidity, they need the cash, there's something that happens to the investment that needs more money put in, they don't have the money, and so what happens? They lose it. So you cannot be successful as an investor if you put all your money in number three, you know, with any high probability. That doesn't mean nobody can, but, it, but you'd have to be extremely fortunate to have that happen. So you've got to fill up one, then fill up two, then fill up three. So you know, if somebody's earning $50,000 a year, <coughs> how much realistically should they have in bucket one? 
How, how much should they try and build up in bucket one before they start investing in bucket two? What, what, what do you think would be a reasonable number? 10 percent? Yeah. Yeah, 10, 15 percent, something like that. So let's say, let's say we're going to put 5,000 here, all right? So now we're going to let it flow over into bucket two. How, how big would bucket two be? You know, maybe five times. So get it up to 25,000. So, so you might want to have at least $30,000 in liquidity in bucket one and two before you'd ever even think about getting down to three. And I, I could make arguments for, n for somebody in that situation never going to bucket three. You know, just, you know, I mean, just totally staying away from it for a long period of time. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.